Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Jim, for taking part uh, in this series of, of chats, um, just sort of um, looking at um, the work and life of our leading naturalists in the Northeast. Um, I'm Professor Annie Tindley, and I'm a trustee of the Natural History Society. Um, Jim, I wonder if you could quickly introduce yourself to the listeners. So, if we're using titles, I'm Emeritus Professor Jim Edwardson. Um, uh, I have been a trustee of the Natural History Society. I grew up on Tyneside in South Shields, and I've had a lifelong involvement with the Hancock Museum, with the Society, and with natural history. That's wonderful. So, so Jim, um, growing up, uh, you said South Shields, I think, and on yes. Pineside. What, what got what first got you into into this area of of well, natural? History? I'm intrigued by your question because the answer is I don't know. But my very earliest memory being taken in a pushchair by a family friend to see an ornamental pond with large goldfish in. And they absolutely captured my imagination. Yeah. And then shortly after that, I remember probably I was about three or four by this time. My mother used to take me and my smaller brother occasionally to feed the chickens at so-called a Collie's Farm, a farm still in the heart of the town, as it were. Yes. And we used to feed them. And I remember feeding them one day and walking away. Um, and that was business as usual, but we looked into an adjacent field and there was a large black and white bird with red legs and a red bill. And I think I was daft enough to suggest we might try and feed it. And I didn't know what it was and my mother didn't know what it was. And it was clearly an oyster catcher which had flown in. And that was one of the wonderful things that even in a really busy and a dirty town like South Shields at yeah. the time, post-war years, um, one could see oyster catcher, curlew, lapwings on fields in the middle of the town and no one took any notice of it. That's wonderful. So, so that kind of captured the imagination. And then how did you kind of get into, I suppose, a more formal study of it or how did you progress from that? So I had a grand, my grandfather, um, m my mother's father, um, he'd had a, a kind of a quite tragic childhood. His father had been killed in a colliery explosion in Seam Harbour right. um, when he was eight years old and a few years later he went down the pit himself so he'd spent his entire career down the pit mm -hmm. but he used to describe to me the relief of getting your day off at the weekend and particularly in good weather emerging into the countryside or the coast after a week spent, you know, at the cold face. Mm -hmm. And he was very enthusiastic. And, and one of my great treasures is, I've got his book. Um, and um, what it says is, it says Robert Alexander, that was his name. And it's mm -hmm. dated um, September the 12th, 1888. So he was 16. He was the breadwinner for the family, but he'd already started to buy his, his own books. And it's a boy's own natural history. Oh. And when I was seven, he gave it to me and he said to James, may he get as much pleasure as I have done from it. Oh. And I think kind of, I just feel that's so lovely that he was interested, but he was interested in everything. I mean, I don't know what kind of university professor he would have turned out to be had he had the opportunity but he had several options, some of which were far beyond my, 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 my potential. Um, so he was interested in everything. So he wasn't kind of particularly guided. Mm. Um, and then I guess when I went to school, my highest academic achievement was to be made monitor of the nature table at Leggett Lane Primary School at the age of seven. Amazing. Um, it's all been downhill since then, you know. <laughs> You peaked um, too soon. <laughs> I, I peaked. I, I peaked too soon. But again, that that was quite interesting because I was made monitor because every fortnight we were travelling from South Shields mm. to see my uncle, my, my grandfather's son, mm. who himself had had his um, back crushed in a mining accident, and he was permanently in the spinal injuries unit at Hexham Hospital. But going to 
from South Shields into Hexham at all seasons of the year was fantastic for anyone who was in charge of the nature table. So I used to come back on Monday mornings, you know, loaded with bags of, of, of this and that. And that so taught me, first of all, to, to kind of learn to collect things mm -hmm. myself. And then I went on to secondary school where I was deemed not to have very much academic um, potential except by one or two of the staff. And one of them was a guy called Fred Gray, mm -hmm. who was um, the English teacher in the school uh, and who was um, uh, kind of um, uh, regarded in awe by the, 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 my fellow students, my fellow pupils, because he was, his nickname was Basher, but that's because he'd had a, a background as a, as a boxer in his youth. But okay, not because he bashed you. No, 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 no. But I don't think we understood that. Um, and he, he was a very athletic, um, sporty man. And at that time, I'd started to collect birds' eggs. Okay. I was, say, 12, 13. And one day he collared me in the, the corridor. I'd never met him before um, to, to speak to. And he said, you're Edwardson, aren't you? And I thought, oh dear, I'm in, I'm in for it now. He said, and I hear you collect bird's eggs, is that right? And I said, yes, but I only ever take one from a nest. And he said, well, listen, he said, I run the bird club here and we meet on Thursday evenings. And I think if you came along to that, you might find there are kind of more interesting things to do. Oh. And that's what got me hooked. And then he started taking me along to the Natural History Society. Yeah. which um, met up at the university and occasionally we had visits to the museum. Um, first person ever to take me to Gosforth Nature Reserve, for instance. So yeah. we're talking about mid-50s then. Yeah. So by that time I was a real enthusiast. I think that was probably my, my peak between 15 and between 15 and 18. Um, I'm sure not. But do you know, Jim, what I find just, just interesting about that is, and, and this is, might be an impression that you might want to correct, but was there a, a, quite a, a contrast between the sort of industrial, coal mining, sh shipping kind of day-to-day -day life, and then the natural history world going out into the Tyne Valley or onto the coast? Or did, or did they kind of, I was just thinking about the oyster catcher in the middle of the dirty city. Right, well, in a moment, I'm going to show you something else. So he was also the first person of a bird club from the school to take me to a place called Jarrow Slake, which no longer exists. Right. That was King Egfrith's port in the seventh century, overlooked by Bede's monastery. And it was a huge intertidal, mud flat right. and um, I actually won the Hancock essay competition in that would be I guess 1959 um, by submitting um, uh, uh, an ecological study of um, Jarrow Slack and Slake and the numbers were phenomenal. I've just been looking at a note which says Golden Plover, about 6,000. I was there with friends. So, I mean, um, 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 I think we were good at counting. So huge flocks, curl you in their hundreds. And these seabirds and waders, they flew over the Tyne, the yeah. whole Tyne. And there were fields in the middle of the city, where, in the middle of the town rather, yes. where we saw a bird. So I don't, there wasn't that distinction but one just knew that curl you on mud flats with, for instance, great vessels, ships, seagoing big tankers and so on, passing in the background yes. was not the natural environment. So I love to get out in the countryside, but you would see an enormous amount in the town. Another thing about the town was that it was, it was a port for the whaling industry. Uh -huh. And I had friends at school whose fathers um, sailed away for a year, two years at a time with these whaling boats. And they brought back things like 
you know, a sperm whale's tooth or something like that, or bits of whalebone and so on. So I think one was very conscious of um, the wider world of natural history as well. And of course, the Hancock Museum fed that. It was yeah. just this wonderful repository of stuff from the whole world. It was fantastic. I mean, I always wanted that huge spider crab that's still <laughs> on display there, yes. That, yes. <laughs> that would have filled any boy's bedroom. So. That would have been perfect. My, my, a favourite of mine was the, the dodo. Yes. In the, in the, in <laughs> or a great orc. <laughs> yes. I <laughs> know. Yes. So, so, so just before we come back to, to your own path, just just reflecting a bit on the on the numbers that you were counting uh, at that time in in the sort of mid to late 1950s so so have you seen you know cr across your lifetime a, a decline a major decline or there's certain air or is there success yes. well? no, no uh, a shocking decline a curl you was something i could guarantee to see any day of the year had i wanted by going not so very far into the uplands of kind of Tyneside or any time during the whole long winter period at the coast. Mm -hmm. I used to listen sometimes at night in bed with the window open and you could hear these birds crying, you know, calling as they called over the, the town. And it still is my favourite sound, but it is so rare mm -hmm. and the numbers are so small now. Yeah. Um, and it's like that with many, many other things as well. One of the notable things, and um, uh, I discovered myself, one of my first really interesting discoveries, um, close to my school, uh, there was um, an old area of slum housing, which um, during my teenage years, the council pulled down. And they pulled it down over a couple of years as people were gradually put into new council housing. And they leveled it, but they did nothing to clear it up. So there were bricks and all sorts of timber rotting and so on. And one morning I was down there walking through this area and I saw this very large flock of birds, brown and white and black. And I looked at the first one, I, well, I, they were obviously not sparrows. And I did remember a picture of a snow bunting. I'd never seen one before, right. kind of in a book. Um, and I went back and I thought, well, but this is a huge number of birds. I counted at least sort of 200. Went back and told Fred Gray, and he was down there like that evening, you know. He was absolutely convinced I've got it wrong. It was going to be a huge flock of linnets or... And he came back and he was so thrilled. So to see 200 snow bunting, and they came back for several years as long as that flight, as long as that site existed. Yeah. So that was, um, that was kind of a wonderful experience. Now, you know, people, if they see one or two snow buntings, they will, it goes immediately, the photograph goes immediately onto their Twitter account and it's regarded as, but the whole of the coastal area now, which is one big kind of um, grass field managed by the National Trust, which everyone in the country knows because it's where the Great North Run finishes yeah. each year. Um, that used to be arable farming. So there were stubble fields, there were dry stone walls, there were fields of potatoes and turnips and so on. Mm. And they, being immediately on the coast, attracted birds nesting and overwintering. In, in huge numbers and those numbers have declined. But other things have increased. Mm. So at my little garden feeder in my postage stamp front garden, I've had up to 15 um, uh, goldfinches down, for example. Now yeah. I never saw a goldfinch during my entire bird watching days in South Shields. Yeah. And, and now they're everywhere. They're, they're they're commoner than sparrows. Yes, yes. Yeah. So there are some. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? Well, I'll, I'll maybe come back to that in the end because uh, one thing I was going to ask you is about, you know, given the the sort of radical changes, you know, you've observed over time as 
is is how how what what kind of advice would you give someone who wanted to get into natural history now? But but before we do that, maybe we can go back to your own path then, and and after school, and 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 what happened after that? Right. Well, two things had happened to me, and one happened very early, and and kind of people ask me, well, what did I specialise in? And I've always been honest and said nothing. If people ask me, I always call myself a budding, um, a budding, a budding naturalist, um, because I haven't bloomed into some of the fantastic specialists they have, particularly within the Natural History Society. And I've got a couple of reasons for that, I think. And there's a very ancient Greek poem by a Greek poet called Archilochus, and it has what people think was probably a Greek proverb in it. And it says that the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. And um, that was, there was an essay written on that fragment of poetry by Sir Isaiah, Isaiah Berlin, I think back in the, in the, in the 50s or the, perhaps the, the, the 60s. And it's kind of, I look at science and I see my colleagues who are hedgehogs. They have spent their entire career working on one thing. It's an absolute overarching obsession. They won't think about working on anything else. And they're the people who get Nobel Prizes by and large, you know, and are first into the Royal Society and so on. Fox in that respect, it was always the next thing that interested me most. So I didn't specialize. I obviously had to, especially, but then there was another thing. Once the biology teacher didn't turn up at school, and uh, a teacher, Peter McArdle, turned up. He was uh, uh, trained in physics. And he said, I've been asked to stand in, um, he said, and I don't know anything about the subject. But he said, I am going to tell you about something really interesting. He said, earlier this year, he said, in the science journal Nature, and we all said, kind of, what's that? And he explained about nature and science publications. He said, there was this publication by this, uh, uh, team um, of um, uh, Crick and Watson on the structure of DNA, he wrote DNA on the board and he actually managed to get it over in such a way that it suddenly clicked, I mean it was just like a light being switched on, mm. we're all animals and we all share similar genes and a basic common mechanism mm. and so I think from that point on my view of natural history was enlarged so anything even human was kind of fair game to me and especially cellular stuff and, yeah. and then I also realized there were other areas of natural history that hardly anyone was interested in so for a short number of years I was quite a keen um, sea fisherman well I wasn't very I was hopeless actually but I was enthusiastic and I would catch small codling or whatever bring them home and kind of looking at them and dissecting them, I realized their gills would often have um, uh, small parasites on them of, of various sorts. Mm -hmm. And if you open their guts up, we're looking at, which I also did, um, they were full of worms as well. And I became interested in parasitology and it was, that was natural history as far as I was concerned as well. But you couldn't see much of that in the Hancock Museum, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so a few, a few examples. So, and in fact, uh, so I went off uh, to read zoology at Nottingham University, um, thinking it would be grand to finish up as the, um, the warden on the Fair Isle Bird Observatory. Yes. And then I thought, actually, no, I had an offer of a PhD studentship to look at a, a parasitic disease in uh, livestock in, in, in Mexico. But the very last lectures I had over the whole course were by the head of department and they were on the brain. Right. And he kind of just gently pointed out that this was one of the last great frontiers in science we knew nothing about it and the scope was endless mm -hmm. and it wasn't just human behavior it was animal behavior and so on mm -hmm. and I was a complete convert and that's the thing 
I, I eventually knew I had to settle down and, and earn a crust. So I, I did a PhD at the Institute of Psychiatry um, and then had lectureships at Aberdeen and Imperial College and St. George's Hospital Medical School. And um, to cut a long story short, I was invited back to Tyneside by the Medical Research Council to take on a Medical Research Council unit at the General Hospital, the old General Hospital site mm -hmm. in 1979. So I came back and the kids thought it was wonderful because we had grand, they had grandparents to see who they'd not seen very much of during their childhood in these other places. And yes. the first thing I did was get back into um, the society and so on. So incredible. Um, wow, that's incredible. I mean, it sounds like, I, I suppose, like for many of us, you know, it sounds like there's been some very key teachers and lecturers who were there, right place, right time, and you were open to all read different ideas like the fox. <laughs> and but having those having those uh, you know those um inspiring teachers and and lecturers can make such a difference can't it no, they are everything um people often have said to me oh well you must have worked very hard for that and so on and i honestly think that most successes in life are not down so much to hard work. I know thousands and thousands of really hardworking people in all areas of life, and, and they've not been able to have such a kind of an exercise. It's entirely down to fortune. You have a mentor. As my grandfather used to tell me, I think it was Plutarch, the quotation, the mind of a young person is not a vessel to be filled but a fire to be ignited, you know? And I absolutely believe that with all my heart about, it. and a few people catch the imagination of a certain person. And that's, and that's what fires them. And I think one of the sad things about, particularly in the Northeast today, there's still so much poverty of aspiration and poverty of enablement, and people still are not being kind of, um, Make, made to make those right connections that would really enthusiasm. I, I know that higher education has changed beyond all recognition and I'm not sure I could do the job now. But I'm sure you could you could do it with your eyes closed. <laughs> well, but it also reminds me of the value of kind of older people because I think um, you know there's a great scope for interaction with young enthusiasts and so on um, and so, one of the things I thought the society was always good at. Enabling that interaction and and education and as it's igniting the fires. Yes yes and also I mean when I got involved with the society um, the secretary of the society, the executive secretary, sort of Claire's equivalent, um, was Grace Hickling. And she was a formidable lady in kind of tweed suits and so on, and very well spoken, mm -hmm. and was an absolute kind of command, I imagine, of counsel and, and, <laughs> and so on, you know. Um, everyone spoke. But when I won the Hancock essay um, competition, she said, um, I want you to come up and talk to me about your project and so on. And it was wonderful. And I went up to the museum and had a cup of tea with her. And I felt like I was meeting God. Yeah. <laughs> Where she, <laughs> she, well, I was, yes. And, but she was so enthusiastic and kind and wrote me a nice note afterwards the sort of thing people did in those days a handwritten note you know for dear dear James and I'm sure you're going to do well at university and oh. so on and that's kind of encouragement was 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 wonderful so I've been very very fortunate I've had the most wonderful kind of mentors and and teachers mm. and it's something I've tried to make sure to the best of my ability I kind of was able to give to people on the way out Yes. And that, 
and and that's a wonderful thing too to kind of to take someone perhaps much background or qualifications and then see that spark catch light and then one of the technicians for example the technical staff um in the mrc unit where i i kind of turned up to to be the director in 1979 i think he's now still the um the pro vice chancellor in charge of international research at a leading australian university and oh. another another girl who came as a technician to the unit she's at uh, kyoto and director of international studies and has a oh. professorship and so on and i think there's no kind of area of study more easily um, capable of capturing the imagination of, of young people than natural history and conservation and so on. You see the, the thirst for kind of David Attenborough, you know. Yeah. He's, a, yeah. he's a national treasure, isn't he? And people Thanks. fall on his every pronouncement. Um, yes. Yeah. I think you're absolutely spot on and you think about you think of well sort of international figures like Greta Thunberg and you know the the movement of of children and young people in addressing obviously the kind of climate change crisis etc um I mean I, I suppose that might be a you know a nice a nice question to end on which is aside from you know benefiting from those mentors and teachers that you might come across what would be your advice for future naturalists in terms of, of of getting into the scene and, and and developing their interests, so that was advice I genuinely got from my grandfather, which was, "Let it come to you." Mm. So, not a question of going out and blundering everywhere and so on, but just finding somewhere, and 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 kind of sitting down and. You might spend an hour and nothing happens, but then suddenly everything happens. Yeah. And uh, I still think that's, I think that's true. I mean, I'm sitting in my study at the moment and I can look out kind of, and uh, there's just sky, but 200 yards away, there's the town moor. Mm. Um, and uh, so the sky just outside my study window is a flight path for all sorts of things in, I think it's 24 years we've been here this year out of my study window. I've many, many times, for instance, seen sparrow hawks doing their mating kind of display flight, but twice seen peregrines fly over and wild geese and yeah. so on. It comes to you if you've got the eyes to see it. And yes. There's yeah. no excuse for anyone not being a naturalist, really, is there? I know it's just sort of putting aside the time not looking at phones and computers and just observing what's around you you know with an open-minded kind of way yes drop the social media and sit at the window with your eyes open that's right ignore the twitter on your phone yes. and pay attention to the twitters outside <laughs> yes so I must tell you this story yesterday morning I got up flung back the bedroom curtains, the sun was shining and outside there's been a tree for the last 20 odd years, uh, a mature tree, uh, one of these sorbus crosses that they planted a lot in parks but um, has red berries on. It hasn't been doing very well for the last five years but the last two years have been better, it's produced more leaves, more, more berries, so I was kind of optimistic about it. And I was aware of this lorry turning up in the street outside yeah. and um, came through the back and I could hear this noise and I couldn't work. There were building work going on next door so I thought it was connected with that and I went back 10 minutes later and this tree had been absolutely felled. No. Yes, yeah. Council order, they claimed, though none of us had been told about it and it clearly did have um, a disease but um, I think it was recovering from it so there's a bit of an issue with the, the tree department with the council and I've got several neighbours who are kind of calling them to task over it but that shouldn't happen really without consultation but there were 10 goldfinches 
on the highest branches yesterday mm. morning, all twittering away. Um, <laughs> but no more Twitter from that direction. Oh, no. I know Newcastle doesn't have a very good record when it comes to its trees, does it, in the city council area? But right. Yes, they have threatened quite a lot, but... Uh, I know. Well, it came to my doorstep yesterday, literally. So that's interesting. But but and I suppose it kind of reinforces the message that without people observing and caring, you know, these things can will, will just sort of happen, you know. And so I suppose it falls to all of us to be a bit be observant and be part of our natural world. And we are part of it, as you said at the start. We're all we're all animals, and we're all in the same in the same ecosystem. So. But thank you so much, Jim. That was absolutely fascinating. Thanks, um, welcome. And yeah, thank you on behalf of all members and trustees of the of the society um, for this. I mean, we could go on and on, but I'll I'll call this this particular session to the end. But I think we should have a sequel. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Right. Thanks, now.